Uh, hello everybody, my name is Dmitry Lugunov. I am curator of entomology collections at the Manchester Museum. Uh, today we have a special guest, Graham Proudlow, who is one of our honorary associate curators, and at the same time he is a specialist on cave biology, specialist on cave fishes. Manchester Museum retains lots of thousands and millions of specimens, and each of them has its own story. And today we are going to talk about the story of one particular cave fishes. Yeah. In this bottle we have a, a brown trout. It's a common enough fish found all in rivers all over the place. But this fish was collected in a cave in the Yorkshire Dales called Ingleborough Cave. Ingleborough Cave is open to the public. At least some of the cave is open to the public. You, you can go and visit it. But beyond the end of the public bit there's a lot more cave which is only explored by cavers. And in 1974 a friend of mine, who is now long dead, called Dick Glover, collected this brown trout a long way into this cave, Ingleborough Cave, and he was quite interested at how it how to got there. And he wrote a little article in 19, four years later, in 1978, he wrote a little article about this fish. So this little article here is specifically about this animal in this bottle. And it tells, me, tells us where he collected it and why he was interested in it. And I saw this paper in 1978 and became quite interested because I was a biologist and I was also a caver. And so I became interested in this in cave fishes generally. And in 1979 I inherited this fish from Dick Glover and he gave me the specimen. And at the time I was, in 1979 when I inherited it, I was working in the Lake District, which is the home of the Freshwater Biological Association. And I asked various people in the Freshwater Biological Association um, if they would look at this fish for me and, tell what, and see what they could tell me about it. And one person looked at the contents of the guts of the fish, we took the stomach contents out, and we could see fairly quickly that the stomach had food in it, and it also had small stones as well as uh, small animals. And somebody else at the Freshwater Biological Association had done a lot of work on the feeding of brown trout, and he could tell us that if there was food in the stomach rather than the intestine, the fish had fed very recently, within one or two hours of when it was killed. And so we knew straight away that this fish must have been feeding within the cave, because it couldn't possibly have travelled from where it originally come from in the two or three hours in which the food stayed in the stomach. So we knew straight away that this animal was living and feeding in the cave. Also, it's, the front of its face was very battered because it's obviously been feeding on the bottom amongst the stones rather than in mid-water where it's cramped off from the do feed. And so we knew straight away that this animal had been feeding on the ground. We could also see quite clearly that it was very light in colour, a very white colour. And we asked the question, had it lost its pigment, because we knew that real cave fishes, which are found in the tropics mostly, lose their pigment completely. And we could also fairly quickly, by looking at the, at the skin with a hand lens, we could see that in fact, no, that it hadn't lost its pigment. The pigment was simply contracted into the centre of the pigment cells. And that makes the fish look very white. Uh, if you took the fish out of the cave and put it in daylight again, the pigment would then disperse to the um, extremities of the pigment cells. And the fish would look dark again. But in the cave, for various physiological reasons that we don't understand, the pigment contracts and the fishes look white. The other question that people would ask you is, is it blind? Um, we can see, it's per see perfectly well it's got perfectly good eyes, uh, big eyes, and almost certainly it's not blind. But it's certainly a, 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 quite a, a remarkable looking animal, very, very light in colour. And Dick Glover had seen many of these fishes, not just one, but there were more, several dozen of these fishes in, in the particular lake where he collected it. Uh, it's very interesting, but I never heard of uh, trout uh, living in caves. Do they migrate to and from caves on a regular basis? Could you tell us, please? I could tell you a little, little about that, yes. Um, what we think is that the trout, uh, in this particular instance, this particular fish, must have come from d above the cave. It must have come downstream into the cave from streams above the cave. Um, it, it's theoretically possible the fish could have come migrated upstream from below the cave, but in this instance that's not possible because between this fish and the downstream entrance is a waterfall 12 feet high in a passage one metre wide and it's pitch dark and there's no possibility that this animal could migrate upstream against this waterfall, it's impossible. So it must have come from the surface above the cave by coming downstream. Now that's pretty remarkable because the largest waterfall in England is, is, is in a cave, cave called Gaping Gill on, the, on Ingleborough. And this animal, it was found at the lower end of this system. So this animal originally existed in the stream above Gaping Gill, 
which is 340 feet deep. And so this animal has basically been swimming around in the stream along with all its friends uh, in, in the stream of Gaping Girl and at some point the floods come along and wash them all into the cave and they've then migrated downstream pretty much against their will with the current and they've ended up in this big lake where the current obviously is a lot less because it's a lake rather than a streamway. And so this animal and all its friends in the lake in the cave have all come from 300 feet further up, this, up, up, up on the hillside. Now, this is the, when I've told people this, they were highly sceptical that animals could fall 300 feet down a shaft and survive. Somebody else who worked at the Freshwater Biological Association was a, also an expert on trout, the ecology of trout, and he said that in Canada, the lakes in Canada are stocked with fish by the pouring out of aircraft. So therefore, fishes falling a longish way into deep water isn't really an issue. And certainly, when the stream of Gaping Gill is in flood, it falls down this 300-foot shaft, and at the bottom will be a lot of deep water, six to eight feet deep. So these animals are falling in water, into deep water. And so there are two reasons why it must have come from upstream. One is it, it can't have come from downstream, it's physically impossible. And secondly, it's, it's perfectly reasonable for it to fall down this shaft, surrounded by water. Um, the other thing that people would say was, ah, no, that can't, that can't work. What has happened is the eggs have got washed in, because eggs are only small things, and then they've, the eggs have developed underground. This is, this is probably almost certainly completely wrong. Um, trout lay their eggs into nests of gravel, uh, where the, and the females choose the nests of gravel very carefully, so the water is oxygenated and clean. And it's a well-known fact, has been for a long time, that if the eggs are washed out of these nests, they die very quickly. So this animal hasn't been washed out of its nest and washed a mile through the cave and then developed. It simply hasn't happened like that. Is it the only species of trout which lives in caves? In this country, yes. In this country, it's quite remarkable that of, of all the different sorts of fishes that we have, only two species of fishes are found in caves regularly, the brown trout and the bullhead. And almost certainly the reason for that is that these, these two species live in, are perfectly capable of living in small upland streams, whereas most of the fishes that you can think of live in big rivers at the valley bottom level. And so these two fishes um, will live happily in upland streams. Um, but one difference between the trout and the bullhead, both of which are common enough in caves in Yorkshire, is that the bullhead doesn't contract its pigment into, into the centre of its cells and look white. The bullhead still looks dark. And if you're crawling, up a, up, crawling on your hands and knees up a passage and you can look in the water and see a bullhead, but they're quite dark. Uh, and against the dark boulders in the floor, they're quite hard to spot. Whereas the trout, you can spot a mile away because they're very, very white. Uh, I know you published a book on the cave fishes. Could you just, uh, it's my fi final question is, uh, could you tell us how many cave fishes exist in the world? Right. And are they b well studied or not? Right, that's a good question. Um, when I started, when I became interested in, in cave fishes in about 1979, there were approximately 35 known species of real cave fishes. Now I just need to differentiate between this trout and real cave fishes. Uh, real cave fishes live in caves permanently. Uh, they breed there and they live there and they feed there and they do everything there and they never come out again. This trout is just a stray basically from the surface. But if we go to real cave fishes, they only live in the tropics. Um, the nearest cave fish to England is in Iraq. Um, when I started my interest in 1979, there were about 35 known species of real cave fishes. As of this month, there are 215 species. So I started to catalogue, in 1979-80, I started to catalogue the real cave fishes. And I made a list of these 35. And then I kept, kept coming across papers with a new species being published, so I'd add that to my list. And I'd add that to my list. And I started writing this book in uh, about 19, about two, about 1980 I started writing this book. And by about 2004, I still hadn't finished it, I decided that I'd better just draw a line. Because every six months there was another new species and another new species, and this list never got to, to an end. And so in this book, I think there are about 180 species. Uh, now there are 215, and the number of species per year is of the order of five, six, seven, or eight species, new species per year. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much.